Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's move on to the next session, the last session uh, of the Riga conference. Uh, I have to say that I am, like some of the people who've gone before, I am a, a newcomer. I am a Riga conference virgin. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, and I have to say, this has just flown by. Uh, it feels really like five minutes ago I was stepping on the plane to head out to Riga. Interestingly, on the flight, I bumped into a, a former BBC colleague of mine uh, who was heading this way, and I said, you know, this is going to be really interesting. He nodded, and he said, it'll be brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure it'll go the distance. And I thought, well, that's not quite the event I was expecting. Uh, he's come for the uh, World Cruiserweight Boxing Championship tonight <laughs> with Latvia's world champion boxer. Um, so, delighted to say, no bloodshed so far, um, no, not too many fisticuffs, but plenty of room for verbal sparring, and I think this is one of those topics, perhaps, where we could expect a little bit of that. Uh, the question here is about populism, as you know, the political and economic consequences of populism in Europe, and there's a very useful rubric in the, in the program that you might have had a look at already. Just to introduce this, really, I want to take you back barely 12 months ago. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker's State of the European Union address to Parliament, in which he talked about the EU in an existential crisis. He said he couldn't remember a time when governments were so weakened by populist forces. This was post-Brexit, of course, among other things. Roll on 12 months. And the State of the Union address had no reference to populism. It was a very upbeat new dawn, in a way. And uh, Jean-Claude Juncker was talking about the, the wind in the sails of the European Union. That was before the German election, where the AFD, as you know, got 13.5%. They've got seats in the Bundestag. Tomorrow, what have we got? We've got a referendum in Catalonia on independence, which is obviously destabilizing for one major member state. And let's see whether that is perceived to be an EU issue uh, at the same time. And by the end of October, Austria will have had an election as well. We'll see uh, how well the Freedom Party feels they can do there. So, if we talk about fresh winds in the sails of the EU, I think it's also fair to say there are crosswinds. Uh, perhaps there always have been, perhaps there always will be, but how strong they are, how great the counterpunch, if you like, is obviously uh, a significant element in terms of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in some of the big issues, critical issues, they haven't gone away. Issues to do with refugees and migrants is still a critical issue. Immigration, still a critical issue. Um, austerity for so many member states, still a critical issue, as is unemployment, youth unemployment. All these critical issues, they have not gone away. And I wonder what that means for populism in Europe. But the only thing that seems to be going away, of course, uh, sadly, is the U United Kingdom. Um, so on that note, I want to introduce our panel, uh, a, a very distinguished panel indeed, uh, and uh, I would like to start uh, from the far side by welcoming uh, Professor Vera Vika Freiberger, the former president, of course, of the Republic of Latvia from 1999 to 2007, and president now of the World Leadership Alliance, uh, and a leader in so many different directions and fields that uh, have a look at the biography. We've only got an hour and a half. Sven Mixer is the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Estonian government, uh, a Social Democrat Member of Parliament for the last 18 years now, and twice Defence Minister of Estonia. Sven, thanks for being with us. Franz Timmermans, uh, it's another of these uh, biographies that goes on a bit, but uh, let, let's get to the point. First Vice President of the European Commission, responsible for better regulation, inter-institutional relations, rule of law, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and with a, a background which runs through uh, national government, uh, the European Commission, of course, and the OSCE, France, thank you. Uh, and I've got this far, and I haven't even mentioned Donald Trump. Well, <laughs> we don't have Donald. We do, however, have James Carafano, a member of the Trump transition team, uh, 
James is the Heritage Foundation's Vice President for Foreign and Defence Policy Studies and also an E.W. Richardson Fellow and the Director of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Relations. So, panel, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And, um, President, I'm going to start with you, if I may. We've got a, a big topic here. Um, populist parties stretch from there to there on the political spectrum. Um, can you define populism and, and how important is it that we try and do that at the start? I'm not sure I can give you a simple and definitive answer uh, as to what populism is, but I would uh, entreat everybody uh, to reflect a bit uh, about uh, its uh, true meaning. I, I do believe the word has uh, taken on uh, a meaning that we automatically assume uh, to be negative and uh, somehow along with this uh, denotation comes the feeling that uh, there's some sort of elite uh, looking down its nose at the great unwashed and uh, at the hoi polloi uh, who are um, readily led and misled uh, and, uh, uh, and we are above it. I would like to remind you that um, my discipline psychology decades ago already uh, produced any number of studies, including by Tversky and Kahneman, famous ones, um, about the difficulty for human beings to take rational decisions and for the difficulty uh, of using information uh, and drawing logical conclusions from it rather than emotional ones. Now, populism is, is uh, an aspect of politics uh, which differs, I think, from genuine, um, admirable popular movements that do move the masses for very good and sound and justifiable reasons, uh, with the difference that it's done hypocritically, it's done with intent to manipulate the masses, to mislead them to sell them fool's gold rather than the real thing by making it shine. And it's also distinguished by uh, the tendency to look for scapegoats that are easily identifiable uh, and uh, close enough that, that you uh, can use the accumulated dissatisfaction, disappointments with life, bitterness, seasonal depression, what have you, that people suffer from, and uh, direct it uh, at some uh, scapegoating target and say, there is the source of all evil. In the Middle Ages, uh, you had Satan and his minions uh, all around, and witches and sorcerers who supported him. Uh, and today, uh, we have various finger-pointing uh, entities or groups or, or, or political uh, positions such as liberalism for instance or Western liberalism which has become a scapegoat, other things are scapegoats as well. Um, and uh, it starts out by, by playing on genuine feelings that people have. Uh, their hopes, their aspirations, their frustrated desires. Uh, these are legitimate things to appeal to if you have rational, feasible, honest methods to offer in order to answer to them. Populism, to my mind, does all that. It promises the moon and does not even deliver the ground that you stand on. A populism misleads people deliberately. Populism plays on their hopes, plays on their fears, uh, but its sole uh, intent is to seize power. And the sad thing is, if you look, whether across the world or through history, wherever popular movements have been what we call populistic in the sense of offering simplistic, not just simple, but simplistic solutions to long-standing, uh, deep-rooted, difficult problems, uh, the end result has been very bad for the people involved, 
and frequently at, it has been uh, a turning to populism has turned into totalitarianism, uh, more or less uh, nasty and more or less bloody uh, in its nature. So you see, we have to be careful not to be snotty about uh, the uh, great unwashed and, uh, and their need for education, but you see, on the other hand, yes, uh, we do need an educated populace, I think, for democracies to run well. And in this day and age, when we are sort of flooded with information, uh, we are flooded with false information, disinformation, false news. Uh, it is, you, you can't necessarily uh, be a sort of superior uh, about thinking of people being taken in uh, by promises because it is so difficult to distinguish the truth from falsehood. And I, I would say that the, uh, the ability to distinguish truth from falsehood the real from the imaginary, the false from the, from the true. Uh, that, in essence, is, is the key of the problem. Can, can I just ask on that, though? You, you started off by saying of, uh, it's of, often the, the, the devil, uh, the populism view, and yet you've balanced that a little bit. Is there a corrective value? Has there been a corrective value in a certain rise of populism within Europe over the last 10, 15 years? I think we have to be very careful in condemning any, any movement uh, uh, that we don't uh, agree with uh, by trying to understand what motivates the people uh, that follow it, what is it that they really want. Uh, sadly, very frequently populist movements uh, will uh, hold up as an aim uh, and, and a goal uh, something uh, that is, again, uh, a graven image that is false, uh, an idol that they have uh, constructed, and that is not the real answer to what the people need. So I think if you're thinking about uh, populism versus democracy or liberalism or, or, or respect for rational thought uh, and reason, uh, then the uh, challenge, the challenge for well-meaning uh, and, and decent citizens uh, is to see what is it that the people are complaining about, what, what are they di disappointed about, what is it they're scared about, and to try and offer answers that will be rational, that will be based in reality, uh, and that have a chance of actually answering to what they hope and desire. Thank you very much. Uh, Franz Timmermans, uh, I think, on, am I right in saying on Monday you'll be addressing the European Parliament uh, with regard, among other things, to Poland's current uh, position uh, on I its judicial reforms and where that leaves you, in fact, in terms of uh, calling for uh, uh, Article 7, called kicking them out, basically, of the European Council, if you can do that. No, good, well, we'll get some more on that. Um, <laughs> I, I think Viktor Orban would veto it anyway. But nonetheless, what does that say about, when we're talking about political consequences of populism, what does that say to you? Where, where do you feel we are? Well, I think um, uh, everything's linked with the Fourth Industrial Revolution, with migration, with um, climate change, and the general feeling uh, in many parts of the world, especially in the middle classes, that they have lost control of their own destinies. They're no longer in charge of their own futures. And, and as you know more than anybody else, um, the, the sentence that perhaps won the Brexit referendum was take back control. And um, this is a reaction you see whenever there is an industrial revolution. You saw in the early 19th century, you saw a form of progressive nationalism coming out of Europe, you know, demanding social rights on the basis of national identity and uh, national cohesion. You saw a very militarized version of nationalism uh, in the 1870s leading to the Franco-German War and later leading to the First World War, etc. And, and now you see a populist form of nationalism uh, across uh, the Western world, but not only there. Look at what's happening in India and the Philippines. It's, a, it's almost a global phenomenon. And I think it's very uh, intimately linked with the fact that the promise of convergence that we said would uh, result from international cooperation, from EU, etc. That promise did not materialize in the lives of many, many people. So what the, then do they do if they see this promise of 
internationalism not delivering, the knee-jerk reaction is to go back to the national level because that served them well in the past. And then, then you create the, this, this new opium of the people, which is nostalgia, to portray a mythical past that actually never was as a proposition for a future that will never be. So what you do is you create disappointment time after time. And so the reaction to that is then to find someone to blame for that disappointment. It's never you, it's always somebody else. Um, and again, we see anti-Semitism is on the rise in Europe, hatred against Muslims is on the rise, hatred against a other uh, nationalities, and of course, against um, you know, unelected uh, anonymous bureaucrats such as myself. Um, it hasn't needed populists to do that, has it? I mean, um, let's be honest. The British, the Br the British people, uh, governments across the EU have been happy to blame well, Brussels for in, many things for many years. But interestingly enough, interestingly enough, because because of Brexit and frankly also because of the action of Trump, I think there was a reaction across the European Union. People say, "Yeah, we're not really happy with the EU." Uh, we don't think it's delivering enough. Uh, we're dissatisfied with some of its policies, but perhaps this might not be the smartest thing to do, and perhaps we might be better off trying to fix the EU rather than leave the EU. I think there's some of this that brought governments back together again uh, in Bratislava and later in Rome, and this is the stage we're at. I think to, 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 to paraphrase Mark Twain, you know, uh, the um, uh, news of our demise last year was slightly exaggerated. The news of everything being hunky-dory is also slightly exaggerated today. Uh, we still face many problems. And the only real solution I see is to come back to the initial promise of any social contract in any society, which is convergence within society, that everybody profits. And not just a happy few, not just a so-called elite. Um, and I think it starts with the middle classes across Europe. Uh, it applies to the United Kingdom just as much as it applies to my country or other countries. And, and there, I think, is the answer to our troubles, is to make sure that we work for a society which is more cohesive in a time of... We are now in the biggest industrial revolution the world has ever seen. It is faster, it is global, and it affects every single human being on this planet. And we need to harness that globalization, but we also need to use the potential of that globalization for the common good. And for that, you know, the nation state is simply too small, unless they have the size of a continent like China, perhaps the United States. But we as Europeans will need the European Union to make that work for our citizens. Okay, I just want to quote uh, Jean Quatremer, a colleague of mine from many years ago, uh, La Libération, he was writing in The Guardian, he said Brexit means the people of Europe will be vaccinated against populist adventurism. Uh, now, there's, there's one point which you're suggesting there, which is that people of Europe will not want to go down the path that the United Kingdom has stepped down. But in pretty much every other respect, is there really a dramatic move away from populism across the EU? No, we have, we have to... Um, we have to, I would count with the situation, just take it into account that populism will be part of our political system perhaps for generations to come because this transformation of our society will take quite some time. And this is the first time since the Second World War that the middle class across Europe fear loss of position. They are more pessimistic about the position of their children and themselves than they are optimistic about the future like they were in previous generations. And this is, is, is a paradigm shift in attitudes towards society. And, and populists or populist, uh, uh, nationalists have an answer to that. Uh, uh, and this answer is appealing because our answer isn't strong enough. Uh, and that's our fault. And we need to fix that. Thank you very much. I should just say, I know some of you are tweeting already. Please keep them coming. I'll draw on them where I can in the course of our discussions here. And questions too, if you want to tweet a question uh, rather than put your hand up, that's uh, absolutely fine. And we'll come to you for questions uh, shortly. Um, but let me move on, Sven, to you if I may. Uh, I was going to say, have we, have we hit peak populism? And how much damage has populism caused over the last five to ten years in particular, let's say from 2008 would be a pretty uh, logical place to perhaps kick on. Well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that we've uh, hit the peak just as yet. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the 
first question you asked from Madam President about the definition of populism. Well, I, uh, I was reminded of um, a saying that's, uh, that, that's attributed to Hugh Hefner, whose death and life uh, have been uh, on the media a lot uh, over the past uh, few days. Uh, supposedly, he was once asked about the definition of pornography, and he said that, it, well, it's very difficult to define it, but we all recognize it when we see it. Uh, I, I, think, I that think that was a high court judge who said that, but that might, might, might be... Oh, well, possibly, possibly. Uh, they, it, it's, it's not even that Im important as to who said it. I think it's, it's pretty much the same with populism. Uh, that, um, well, we are seeing it, it's been around all the time. I think that, that uh, President Freiberger put, uh, put her finger on a, on a, on a very uh, important uh, point um, in, in, in saying that that in, in this world we live in today, many things are, are naturally complex and complicated. Uh, and, and there is a sort of innate desire in, in people uh, to, to like simple solutions to difficult questions, to difficult problems. And, and as it is, I mean, every, every complex and difficult question has a perfectly simple answer, but it's usually the wrong answer. And, and we've seen, I mean, during uh, periods of very speedy transformation in societies and also very uh, big leaps in te technological development, uh, there have always been uh, people straight in the societies that have feel sort of dislocated and, and disoriented. And, 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 and they uh, start to demand that life be pure and simple again, and that gives rise to fu fundamentalist uh, movements. There's always someone who, who pops up and says that, well, I have got a, 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 a simple solution, and I can lead you back to a society where everything is pure and simple. And, and that, that's, that's also the, the sort of underlying uh, reason for the, for the spread of populism. But I think that today, we, well, we are seeing a very, uh, very big, uh, transformation uh, in, in, te in technologies all across the spectrum. But there's one um, thing that makes this current uh, uh, epoch or period of time uh, unique. It's that, that, that we are seeing the revolution in information technologies. And, and the greatest transformation that, that our societies are experiencing these days is that the amount of information that is not just available to us, uh, but that is actually aggressively pushed upon us has exploded over a very short period of time. We have thousands, of, uh, thousands and thousands of times uh, more information uh, available actually coming upon us uh, than we had just uh, a couple of generations ago. Uh, uh, while our uh, capacity to, to actually absorb that information has not expanded correspondingly. And that uh, gets, gets people uh, very confused. And that makes it increasingly more difficult for people to make sense of what is truthful, what, what can be trusted. And obviously there are powers that, that want to explo exploit that new vulnerability. Plus, I think another... Just, sorry, just on that, is that vulnerability here to stay as well, or is it just we are in the moment of that at the moment? Uh, as uh, Zhou Enlai famously said, too, 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 too soon to tell. I, I, I don't think that we have a, an answer to that question uh, just, just as yet. But another Im I important thing to be reminded is that, that with uh, uh, another aspect of that uh, transformation of, of information technology is that, that uh, we have now these uh, tools that actually uh, allow the providers of information to to customize that information. There are algorithms that actually feed you information that, that they expect you to uh, sort of coincide with your preconceived uh, worldview. So you, you, you increasingly start to live in a bubble uh, where you mistakenly believe that everyone around you sees the world the same way you do. And, and, and that actually has a very negative effect on the critical capacity of people to, to critically analyze the, the, the information that is being pushed upon them. So that's, that's I think, uh, one of the underlying reasons, uh, well, in addition to these uh, uh, sort of social inequalities and, and, and uh, uh, financial and uh, stratification and, uh, and, and the other sort of social uh, ailments and, and, and grievances. Okay, and that, that's useful. Uh, 
point I wish to pick up with you, James, if I can. Um, a, do you recognize the characterization you've heard of, of populism? Um, and B, we haven't really started yet to address uh, degrees of responsibility or blame, perhaps, and I just wonder what your perspective might be on that. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to say how comfortable I am sitting here on the far left of the panel. So, um, but, uh, the, so the question I want to answer is... It's the it, far right when you're sitting out there. Oh. Right. It's all a matter of perspective. Well, that works for me, too, I guess. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, is populism um, a threat to, the, to transatlantic democracy and a threat to the transatlantic relationship? And uh, the answer is not much. And, and let me just make um, three points real quickly. Um, first of all, the, the great bind of the transatlantic community is, is not democracy, it's the strategic relationship. We're bound together because we have very critical strategic reasons to do that. We just had a, a really interesting uh, uh, trilateral dialogue with the US, European, and, and India in uh, Stockholm. And I made the point, you know, look, U.S. and Indian relations have never been stronger. It has nothing to do with democracy. I mean, India and the U.S. have been the world's two biggest democracy for decades. It's only in the past couple of years that the strategic alignment between the two countries has drove them incredibly closer together. And it's not the fact that, it, that it's Modi and the BJP, because this is bipartisan. The Congress Party is just as enthusiastic about the U.S.-Indian relationship as, as, uh, uh, as the ruling party. So the, the point is, is we have, we have enormous strategic reasons to be bound together. And, and, and that overcomes uh, the, the political um, discourse. Uh, Europe, I mean, the United States needs a uh, prosperous, uh, free, and stable Europe. And Europe needs a, a reliable partner in the United States. And, and that reality trumps a lot of things. Um, the second point is, is that democracy, our democracies, are, as established democracies, are far more resilient than we give it credit for, and I think that the, the current discourse actually acknowledges. Not, not only am I a historian, um, you know, I'm actually old at this point, and I've, I've lived through a number of populist ways, even in my own lifetime, and this is far from the worst. The 1960s was, the, the political di you know, discord in the 1960s was far worse than we have now, and the counterculture influences were far more disruptive. Um, in the 70s in the U.S. under uh, Watergate, the atmosphere was worse. And the night, we had a great wave of populism in the 1980s that brought Ronald Reagan in office. We actually had a period of relatively social peace following that, actually a fair amount of economic uh, growth and, and actually a, a pretty proactive foreign policy in the world. And, and I would even argue, in the, at least in the United States, in 2007, the political environment was far more bitter, uh, far more ang uh, um, aggressive and, and anxious than it, than it is today. So I, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit. And, and the third point, uh, so I'll be the brief, I think, of everybody, um, which is the most important, is, is democracy in, in, is really the great competitive advantage that, that we have. And to me, populism is really just the canary in the mine shaft, which, which happens in established democracies that signals there needs to be a shift here. But democracies are not only more creative and innovative and productive and all that, but there's an enormous amount of social cohesion that comes from an established democracies that, that is despite our differences in anger and everything else, is the willingness of the governed to be governed. And that's a powerful uh, competitive advantage. And, and I don't think that we exploit that enough in the transatlantic relationship. And I'll just end on this, this thought, because you know, we kind of the, we're yelling back and forth, you know, blaming people for populism, and I think what's being missed is a real opportunity. America has never been more invested and more interested in the transatlantic relationship than we are today. I mean, there is more discourse on this in Washington today than there's been in any period I can remember going, going back to 1989. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is we Americans you know, are invested in the relationship. We want it to be incredibly successful. We, do, we want to do what we can to make Europe successful. We just don't all agree on what that is. Um, but there's an important role there for a transatlantic dialogue. And, and I'm afraid is, is if it's, it remains at this kind of superficial level that's being mediated by media and pundits and, and tweets, and it isn't at the human to human level where we're actually having real conversations like we are here in Riga, we're missing an opportunity to, to embrace the, the opportunities that democracy uh, gives us rather than, than kind of shaming ourselves over its faults. James, it's a cheap shot, but on exactly what you've said, is it valuable to put out messages in 140 characters? Yeah, absolutely. Totally is, because it's a reflection of, of, of democracy. I mean, um, you know, I, I assume you're not talking about anybody in particular, but I'll use President Trump as an example. Um, you know, he is a, um, 
he, he is a, uh, there are two Trumps. Do I have 10 seconds? Can I explain this? Yep. There, 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 you should know this. There are two Trumps. And we have you, 280 characters. Yeah, so the problem is they're exactly the same person. They act the same, they talk the same, they have the same mannerisms. But there is the, the, the serious Trump, which is the leader that makes hard decisions, whether it's the Afghanistan policy or the uh, cruise missile strikes or, or you know, even decisions on whether you're going to impose tariffs or something. And then there's this showman Trump, which is this, which is this public persona that he's had his entire life, which, by the way, transcends social media. I mean, he's had this personality since the 1980s. And, and he's obviously not going to relinquish it, but I think we can figure that out by now. But, but he, he has, and he knows how it affects people, and he uses it as a strategic communications tool. Primarily, it's often to engage with his own base and, and to remind them that I am one of you, I am with you. Um, and he does it very effectively, and he, and, he, and he finds it as a way to kind of bypass traditional media to relate directly to people. Does it upset other people? Sure it does. We hate it when... You know, for example, we're in the media. We hate it when we don't get to, you know, mediate the message, and somebody can talk directly to his constituents in unfiltered ways. So, but I think that's a reflection of the opportunities that democracy presents. And uh, if we shut those off for people that we don't like, then we then we shut it off for ideas and people and voices that we do want to hear. And I think that would be a huge mistake. Thank you, uh, Sven. Well, um, I remember there was someone who said uh, during the Second Gulf War that that the U.S. military is such a terrific hammer that there is a tenden tendency in, in Washington, D.C. to see every problem as a nail. Um, I think that as, well, obviously the U.S. military is very well suited for dealing with some, uh, some contingencies, I mean, defeating enemies, for example, not equally well suited for building up societies or governments. Uh, the same with Twitter or the social media tools. I think, uh, w when you think back to the uh, uh, Arab Spring, I mean, t uh, the social med new social media were extremely effective in mobilizing people against the di dictatorship. But it, it became very apparent that they were, they were not equally well suited for bringing together a new working government. So I, I, I think that, that one of the lessons uh, uh, learned, one, one, one of the things we, we should think uh, about when dealing with these new, new technologies uh, is that, that they are not equally well, well suited for each and every task. I mean, while Twitter may be very, a, a very good tool to, to uh, run an election campaign, it's not necessarily equally well suited for conducting foreign policy when, 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 once in office. Well, that's, I, I think uh, there are limitations to, to everything, including those, those new powerful technologies. I'm, I'm not entirely Could, sure. I'm not entirely sure. I find the idea that there are two Trumps a very comforting thought. Split personality. Um, uh, you know, because... Because uh, uh, sooner or later, any politician will be held accountable for what he says or tweets or does. And you can't eternally tweet one set of truths and then uh, when you need to be a responsible politician, tweet another set of truths. That, that, will, that will become incompatible sooner or later. James, yeah, could, no, could you sorry, come back on that? Is, we'll, um, no, well, you know, that, the point that social media is not good for everything is an incredibly important point. I mean, there's a lot of emerging science and data on this. And what we find is, is social media, uh, media is an enormously important factor, an effective factor, when it connects to a human network. So an election, for example, in an election campaign, social media is awesome because you're connecting with people who are mobilizing voters to begin with. And it really works for Trump in the perspective it, it connects with a natural constituency that he has. The, so it's not his ability to use social networks that's, that's demonstrative and interesting, it's that he is connecting to a human network that's enabling him politically, that's important. I, to but, but I totally... Can I just one comment no, on this? I, but we've seen social media being weaponized by foreign forces. Yeah. I think the evidence is, is abundantly clear now. Yeah, we've seen everything weaponized by foreign forces. So the notion that somebody does something bad with a technology is kind of a non-starter you know, non as a criticism for me. But, but, but the point is, is, and this is where we completely disagree, leaders are judged by rhetoric and action not by rhetoric alone. FDR made a wonderful speech about the Day of Infamy. If the United States hadn't gotten out in World War II, nobody would care. Obama made a terrific speech in Egypt about something nobody remembers because it had no impact on foreign policy. So what Donald Trump, regardless of what you say, what he will be judged for in the global court is not just the rhetoric that he uses on Twitter, but this combination of his rhetoric and his action. So you don't like the rhetoric, get that, 
But in the end, what history will judge him for is what he actually does. But you're making no. exactly the same okay. point I'm making. Yeah, okay. We well, won't, I, agree. We I agree with that. <laughs> we can bat that back and forth. We could always unfollow, I suppose, but um, then we wouldn't know quite what he was saying half the time but in any case. I want to have another tilt. Um, uh, yeah, did you want to say yes, something indeed. on this, Sarah? Um, I think that in, uh, in terms of uh, reaching out to, to large masses of people, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, both it can be used for constructive action and mobilization uh, for excellent and worthy causes. Uh, it can be and is used uh, for manipulation or in other cases as a hidden weapon to destabilize your enemy. You don't need necessarily to have tanks and planes to invade a country. Uh, you can destabilize it and play on its weaknesses uh, and, and this can be just as, uh, as dangerous to its internal uh, stability. Um, but I think that the points uh, of view uh, expressed in an extreme way, and I think we haven't mentioned the word extremism so far, but populism does uh, tend to be linked to extreme points of view, not just simplistic ones, but the ones sort of at the, uh, you know, of, of the normal curve way off uh, in, in both uh, wings. Uh, by the way, that is the reason why left-wing and right-wing populism are such uh, brothers under the skin, because they are uh, at the extremes. But uh, when the extremes start being uh, spread about, tweeted or whatever, and uh, eventually uh, there's a, a backlash. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the, the, the inauguration speech of President Trump and that uh, immortal phrase, America first. Um, it, uh, it has always been part of American policy, we're clearly aware of that, but uh, to put it so bluntly uh, and, and so clearly, that was uh, something new. But what happened in reaction in Europe? Uh, a comic in the Netherlands, you may remember the incident, I don't know if you saw that, um, as imitates, is able to imitate Mr. Trump's voice and, and his style of speech. And, and put out, and, and you can search it out on YouTube if you haven't seen it, and he comes up and says, Mr. President, America is a great country. We perfectly understand uh, that uh, you care for your people and you, you want to put them first. But we have this tiny little, cute little country called the Netherlands. And, uh, and, you know, we really are nice people. We have lots of water, you know. And for instance, we don't need a, um, a wall with Mexico. We have the whole ocean separating us from Mexico. And maybe if America is number one, could the Netherlands be number two? And, and I think then afterwards, if you search on YouTube, you will see that any, I think, Lithuanians and Latvians and others said, could we be maybe number three or maybe number four? Uh, uh, is that realistic? Uh, but in some sense, you see, with humor and, uh, and with that sort of backlash, when somebody goes too, too far out, I think they themselves cut the grass under their own feet. Hopefully, uh, that is always uh, assuming that there, there's a critical mass of rational people around. We have seen periods when uh, a critical mass seized enough power to impose itself. It happened with Nazism, it happened with communists. They didn't give people a choice. They simply imposed their view. That is the dangerous part. But if left free, um, I, I'm sort of sanguine about it. And I think that uh, eventually totally extreme views uh, will prevail among people who have a tradition behind it. There's their cultures that do not have any traditions for, say, equality between the sexes or any number of other notions that we in the West actually espouse. So you do need uh, a period of historical development. You need a period of popular education, probably literacy as well, and so on and so forth. But uh, given all of that, um, I am not totally desperate. Uh, <laughs> I, sometimes I, I, I'm a bit anxious about the appeal of populism. 
because okay. it's it it is thrilling actually to be called uh, to be told that you you are important and, um, you have been neglected by the powers that be but with us you are going to be important we care about you we don't know what you look like or what your name is or anything like that but we care about you well that is, that is I'm going to open it up to the floor and just I'm going to have one more crack and then I'm going to open it up to you I want to a tilt back on the, the European perspective really and I have um, I have Phil in exile to thank for his tweet Phil Brown um, the tweet runs uh, the populism's rise is because of the perception that governments and institutions are unresponsive how true is this of the European Union and France I will start with you for logical reasons um, but I was in Brussels in the 90s it was almost a mantra we must engage with the people this was in the mid 1990s it's taken an awful long time and a rise in populism to get there so it's it's a fair point isn't it mm -hmm. oh it's absolutely a fair point um, uh, for many reasons uh, but we also tend to to neglect our uh, successes um, just uh, give some thought to the city. Hold on, let's just stick on the failures okay. for a moment. No, no. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not disputing all right. success or fine. there. But uh, fine, I, I, will, the, I, the... I will leave the historical success of being in this city where I was also in 1990 and compare it to then. I will just leave that to the imagination of the public. But um, as far as our failures are concerned, one of the biggest failures is the internal scapegoating. Governments blaming Brussels for everything and then Brussels saying, but we're doing the right proposals, but governments are not not responding to that. To your average citizen, um, it, it, the result is that they don't get what they need and they're not interested in who is to blame. Well, they will blame everyone in politics. And so what I liked a lot, one of the elements I liked a lot in Macron's speech is when he says, you know, when we blame Europe, we blame ourselves. We are Europe. And this is a new realization I see now uh, coming about in the 27 member states. Hang on, we cannot um, continue to blame Europe or Brussels for everything because it's coming back to bite us uh, also nationally. So we have to take responsibility for what we do collectively. And, and that, I think, is part of the answer. Uh, but then, of course, this will only work if you actually deliver results. So if, if the economic growth we see now is translated in a more equitable society, if the banks are actually really put under control so that they cannot take taxpayers hostage in the next crisis, if we're indeed uh, able to deliver better security for our nations, if we are coming to terms with the migration crisis, these are the things we need to deliver on if we want to have a chance of regaining the trust of European people. Sven, you're, you're a foreign minister, you sit at the General Affairs Council, is that a view that you and your colleagues share, that we've got to take collective responsibility for some of these uh, issues which are generally pointed at Brussels? Well, I think that we, uh, obviously, I mean, we, we have to take both individual and collective responsibility and, and the question whether, whether governments are responsive enough, I mean, it's a fair question and um, I think that, that at any, any given point in time you, you ask that question, you probably get a majority of people saying that no, the governments are not responsive enough. But, but when, you, when you ask the question, when in the history have the governments been more responsive to people than they are today, I don't think that you can actually point to any, any, any time in history. I mean, the, the uh, governments operate under more scrutiny, under more media spotlight today than they've ever done in the history, and, and um, much more transparent, at least in democracies. I mean, not, not everywhere in the world, unfortunately. So I think that, uh, that, that, that again, it's, it's, it's one of those grievances uh, that is partly justified in that, obviously, we, there's more work to be done, but, but uh, I, I don't think that, that we are doing worse today than we, did, than we were doing 20 or 30, 30 uh, years ago. Uh, but um, I, I think that um, when, you, when you think of the, an, another sort of threat of populism, then uh, I, I think that this sort of the, the, um, the, the aim of those who, who uh, try to take advantage to promote their own agenda via, via, via this sort of um, multitude of different media and, 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 and new media platforms, like social media platforms, is that they, uh, uh, well, they say, uh, those who interfere in the, in the, in the elections, for example, of the, uh, trying to run information campaigns during election campaigns in our, our, our countries, they, uh, what, they, what, they, what they really want to do is not necessarily to, to bring any particular uh, candidate 
uh, to power or, or, or effect the result of the individual election so much. But what they want to do is to discredit the, the, the uh, democratic, liberal democracy by, by discrediting the democratic institutions. The perception we, uh, we, we have enjoyed vis-a-vis -vis the less democratic nations, we have enjoyed a moral high ground, at least in the eyes of our own uh, electorates. And, 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 and if uh, this, we, we, we cannot stand this rise of populism, I think that we risk losing that, that moral high ground vis-a-vis -vis the non-democratic uh, nations, societies, governments. James, quick word from you, then we'll take questions. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's the key point, is, is in many ways populism is the pressure relief valve on democracies. Right? And if, if, so what's the alternative if you don't have that relief valve, and then you are into models like separatism, which are far more destructive. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, a chance to ask some questions. Um, we've got a clutch of hands up here. First, there's a gentleman there. We'll take three or four uh, at a time. Uh, we'll start at the back there and then come to, um, there's a lady in the front row, and then um, Ian. First of if, all, if I want... Could, sorry, just let us know who you are, where you're from as well. My name is Gilberto Morisha. I'm from the Netherlands. First of all, I want to thank the panel for being here and for giving a very interesting discussion for, of, about populism. I'm, I'm a part of the Future Leaders Forum and we had a working sessions about it yesterday. And so we talked a lot about what the former president said, which was about the human aspect of it. You know, ultimately people want to feel cared about. People want to feel that their emotions are valuable. And this is also why Donald Trump, you know, got such a large traction because people felt, wow, he recognizes my reality. And that being so, a lot of people feel as though they are dismissed by the elite and by politicians because their feelings are not recognized. How do we tell a better story? How do we make ourselves more connected and engaged to people like somebody else, like somebody that's different? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gilberto, there's uh, down on the front row. Thank you so much for this discussion. My name is Simonova Maria, I'm from Ukraine. So we spoke about populism as a very negative notion. And I would like to remind you that the populism is just a tool and sometimes you can really use it as a positive tool. For example, when we were standing on the Euromaidan, we were populists because we as activists, we had no arguments that we will win, and the only thing what was left is to be populistic and tell people that we will win anyway, and to, that we will survive, and that we were fighting for democratic values. It was a populism as well. And uh, as your discussion was continuing, I thought that as far the politician away from the citizen, so louder this politician should say, and here is the place for the populism creates. So probably be closer to the citizens is the way to avoid populism. Would you say that the civic engagement, real civic engagement, is the way to avoid the populism? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then the, just one row back, in, and we'll get, we will get to you uh, as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Ian Bond from the Center for European Reform in London. Um, I mean, it's an interesting discussion. I'd like to go back to the, the definition of, uh, of populism that the, the president offered. I mean, it seems to me that two of the things that are most, most dangerous are, first of all, that you have somebody who says, I and I alone can cure your problems. And the second thing is that you have somebody who says, they, sometimes specified, sometimes not, are to blame for your problems. Uh, I liked, uh, I hadn't picked up the point from, uh, from Macron, but I think, it, you know, it sounds a good point. We are responsible, not they are responsible. That's, uh, that's good. But I'd be interested to hear what the panel think you can do to, to immunize people against the idea, first of all, that, um, you know, there is, there is a political messiah who can save you, and secondly, that nothing is ever the fault of the people who are suffering. It's always the fault of some external elite. Okay, I, I think we essentially we've got two questions really here. Um, the first two both focusing on telling a better story in terms of engagement. And I think that again was engage, civic engagement. Um, I, I don't know, uh, President, would you like to start us off? 
I, uh, I believe that in my beginning definition, I pointed out what, what the young lady from Ukraine was saying, that uh, popular movements uh, can have very noble causes and, and, uh, uh, and be extremely justified, and that we have to be careful not to take any, any, any popular movement uh, automatically to brand it as, as negative. Uh, I think Ian Bond uh, put it very nicely in two words. Uh, yes, the, the one person who offers to solve your problems, uh, Freud would say, well, that's the infantilism uh, in all of us. Uh, we're all looking for daddy uh, who will look after us just like when we were small. Uh, and it's so nice to be uh, a small infant again uh, whom somebody looks after. Uh, uh, and it's very deep in us and, and uh, you don't need to be psychoanalyzed to realize that there's a definite appeal uh, in such a thing. The uh, demonizing or, or the finger pointing is a very crucial thing. And in many ways when you're asking, for instance, what should the politicians do? Are they at fault for things happening? Uh, you are asking who is to blame? And I think the question who is to blame uh, leads inevitably to scapegoating. Uh, sometimes, yes, to justifiable criticism. Again, I don't want to, to deny the existence of justifiable criticism. But the sort of blanket uh, feeling that you are to blame or you are to blame. Take the situation of the gap between the politicians and the population. Is it that the politicians have been too far removed and, and have not been clever enough or capable enough uh, assiduous enough to convince the people to explain to them what's what? Or is it that the population have been either too stupid or too lazy or too unwilling to understand? Uh, either one or the other is being blamed. I would say that instead of asking who is to blame, forget about blame, but try and make a diagnosis. What has gone wrong? What needs to be fixed? Why? Is it gone wrong? Why does it need to be fixed? Do we have an answer to how to fix it? How are we going to fix it? And then you can ask who is going to participate in the fixing. But the who is to blame is a very unhelpful question. Oh, yeah. um, so one of the things that was lost in the discussion was, was the, the, actually the democratic value of populism, which, which thank you for bringing up the example of the Euromaidan and the courage of the Ukrainian people, which is it, it provides a political platform to, to transcend traditional political alignments. And, and Donald Trump was certainly an example of that. People that voted for Donald Trump didn't vote for Republicans. You had labor voting for Donald Trump. You had you know, constituents, people that had voted twice for Obama voting for Donald Trump. And, and, in, and at least in the US, the alternative we have to kind of up, the populist breakup is, is, is what we call identity politics, which is you're of a group, I will provide something for that group, therefore you're part of my coalition and you should always vote for me. Um, and, and in many ways, populism has been the natural, the natural kind of counterattack to identity politics in, in the United States. If you have an established democracy, um, what happens is all the frothy of populism, if it doesn't actually represent something significant, if it doesn't actually transform the political order, the frothiness tends to go away and the political order tends to fall back into the traditional alignment. If it does represent something absolutely new and transformative, like it did for example FDR and democratic politics in the 1940s, then it transforms the political system. What we've seen in the, in the, in the brief months that Trump has been in office is a little bit of both. Um, in many ways, we've, we've dropped back to kind of traditional politics. It's certainly true on foreign policy, tweeting aside, you can say whatever you want, American foreign policy in many aspects looks very, very traditional. Um, and even in some of the domestic issues where we see some of the, 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 the high, you know, the big promises have already kind of fallen off the table, like uh, healthcare reform. So um, again, you know, we tend to demonize uh, populism as it must be something bad because it's people who have politics that are, that are not like mine. But yet, it, I, I, I do go back to the far, I think it's a healthy part of a healthy democracy. Okay, James, thank you. Franz, and then uh, what, Sven. What I see as a risk in, in populist nationalism, or whatever you want to call it, is that it's got a winner-takes-all view of democracy, um, um, a zero-sum game view of democracy. So it says, when I win the election, then those who've lost are losers, 
and they no longer should have a voice. When I win the election, because that's democracy, I get to decide how institutions work and function, and I get to control these institutions. Because I don't want to lose the next election, I will try and control all institutions that could perhaps strengthen my opponents and make me lose the next election. Now, the problem with that approach of democracy is, first of all, in, in all our countries, democracy is more about protecting the rights of minorities than it is about imposing the will of the majority. It's always been like that. Secondly, democracies um, uh, with um, uh, open societies need institutions that are protected uh, from uh, the dominance of the democratic vote. They need to be more, uh, um, they need to be entrenched in constitutional orders that protect them against uh, the majority plus one decision making, which is the case in the United States and in, in most European, all European countries. So, um, because if you accept the premise that democracy trumps everything and you get to decide on all the institutions, you, that is a perpetual system because you would then, after an election, just imagine you lose the election, then the new incumbent will have to do exactly the same thing again. So, um, you know, I don't want to enter into definitions of populism. I only see that in political forces that call themselves or are called populist, there is this tendency of saying democracy is the only rule that applies. And I just want to warn against the effect on our institutions. You know, free media, they think they have the right um, to control media because um, media could be a threat to their re-election and they make, have to make sure that the media get the right message out there. And I think we should be more aware of that. And one of the reasons they get away with it, and I'll end on that, is that we are increasingly in a bubble society. We love to be with people with whom we already agree. And we are losing the noble art of disagreeing well because we prefer the comfort of being people with, 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 uh, with whom we agree. And then we lose contact with the world of the others. And that's what happened, I think, to some part. Why was all the establishment so shocked by Trump election? Because they hadn't a clue what was going on in half of the United States. And this is a phenomenon we see in most European countries as well. Um, I just, I'm just going to um, quote George G. Revel's uh, tweet, because I think he would concur entirely with that. Populism is founded at its root on an us versus them mentality. Um, Minister. Well, uh, obviously we can just appeal to people to act more responsibly, but, but I think that, that um, a couple of practical things that we might think of, and I'm not representing Estonian government or any, 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 anyone here, but, but basically what I believe is that, that uh, majority of us do not want to see the political pendulum swing too violently I and mean, periodically. We don't want to uh, have a yeah, sort of uh, extreme right-wing government for five or six or eight years and then the pendulum swing to the other extreme and, and everything sort of demolished and, 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 and reconstructed from scratch. And um, we, we, we thought, should think about the political systems we have, actually. And, and uh, when we uh, revise or, or, or uh, reconstruct those systems, we, we should build them up in a way that, that would not uh, make it easier to win elections uh, by appealing to the, uh, to the extremes. Because, uh, I mean, it's, it, it comes to, to, to some degree, it does come down to the, to, to the, to the way we actually construct our political systems. Uh, because the, I, I do believe that there, are, uh, they, the, there is a sort of core of values and beliefs that we all share. And then when we move further away from that, there are extremes. And, 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 and there are systems that, that make it easier actually to emerge victorious uh, in elections if you appeal or, or the further you move to, from the center. And there are others where it, it, it doesn't produce uh, the victory. And, 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 and we should think of that. The other thing I think with when we think back to the Brexit vote. Uh, well, in, 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 in the computer age, when you hit the delete button, then the computer is designed in a way that basically it, 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 it comes and asks you, well, are you sure you want to delete the page? And you have to hit the confirm button. Perhaps with some decisions that we, that we, that we take, some votes we take, like, well, for example, about leaving the European Union or something, we should 
allow basically design the system uh, in, in such a way as to allow people to sleep on their decision and then hit the confirm button if they are sure that this was what they wanted. It's, it, it doesn't have to be such, an, such a bad way. I think these are some, some things we, we might think of doing in order to actually stem the rise of populism. Mm. Okay, well, there, there are real ideas uh, being thrown out there. I'm going to ask the roving mic to do a little bit of work. If we could come over here first to the lady here, and then I said, um, yeah, yes, sir, and then the chap in the glass is just behind you, actually, but we'll come to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Baiba Braja. I'm Latvian ambassador to London. My question is to Commissioner Timmermans about uh, very much the Commission's role, actually, in... Uh, fighting the uh, propaganda, the, the uh, uh, data uh, used for misrepresentation of uh, truth and so on and so forth. And just an example is that in 2015, after the, during Latvia's presidency, the task force for the strategic communication was created where the member states seconded the representatives to work against the Russian but also other propaganda created there. The commission was very reluctant at the time and still has not actually uh, provided sufficient or any financing to, the, to that Strat Stratcom task force. Uh, even though by now we see that it affects our democracies also through different means. We see that the data is used for micro-targeting people and groups of people. Uh, Information Commissioner in the UK has launched an investigation to see whether that was done during the pre-referendum times. We see it was used in a number of election campaigns. And next year, the big uh, regulation on the data transfers comes into force, the GDPR. So my question is whether the Commission feels, and you as a responsible Commissioner, that you can do much more, both in terms of you know, the practical interest of, of many member states, uh, but also in terms of regulation and the implementation and to see uh, how to proceed across the EU, not only externally. Okay, that's a very specific question for you, Franz. Perhaps we could take that now. And then we'll sure. Uh, I think there is a, an increasing realization, especially in the tech sector uh, and in the social media sector, that they also have a responsibility there. And I think we, we need to come together, uh, perhaps not at a European level, but especially at a transatlantic level, perhaps even a global level, to see how we can regulate that so that, you know, you have the same level of veracity in uh, a new media as you have in classical media. And perhaps, you know, if they can auto-regulate, fine. But if we need to regulate that, uh, uh, I wouldn't be against it. But then again, these are global phenomena we need actually to have a very, very thorough conversation with, with the American administration about this because it, it will not work if we don't do more or less the same thing. Um, but um, I, I don't believe in sort of government agencies to check the truth. Uh, I don't see that as something that will work. I do believe in creating co-responsibility for um, fighting the bots and for making sure that uh, social media are not weaponized uh, by, uh, by foreign agents. And I think this is something, there's an increased awareness within the social media themselves, but also across the Atlantic with governments that this is something uh, we need to deal with. Does that um, help? Okay, thank you very much. Right, now we have a, a gentleman standing there, then the, the uh, chap with the glasses behind, then there's a lady in the front here. Um, thank you very much. I'm Sebastiano Fulci. Uh, the ambassador of Italy here in Latvia. And I'd like to thank Riga Conference and especially this eminent panel to have decided to dedicate the debate to uh, populism, uh, which is a topic uh, that seemed to raise most concern before elections and after that uh, countries or society tended, have a tendency to accommodate to it, um, although it penetrates uh, progressively society uh, in different ways, uh, depending on the countries. Italy is a country that has been severely hit by the crisis, and right now uh, the populists altogether actually occupy the majority of seats in the parliament. And I have to disagree with President Freiberger. Uh, luckily, in this case, they're quite divided. We have the populists from the left divided 
from the populist uh, from from the right. And okay, the populists from the left uh, are quite extremists in the, because they have the idea that uh, to, be, to, to promote um, uh, participatory democracy, which is the Marcus idea of getting rid of parliamentarians and deputies and just uh, allowing people to vote uh, uh, by referendum electronically, and that's what they're trying to do. Um, so I think their, uh, their approach is quite revolutionary and, and dangerous. But to come back to, to my question is, um, when I see what's happening in Italy, uh, there are debates right now, for instance, on uh, vaccines. Uh, the, the populists have started saying, you know, vaccines are dangerous because uh, kids at school will become down if they vaccinated. And, and there's a movement that is growing. And they, they, they use emotions through their propaganda to touch upon the hearts of people. And, and what's the I, I, think, I think that governments should have communication strategies that are able to counteract uh, not only educating people, but with other emotions showing you know, what is the consequence of not having kids vaccinated. Uh, do you have an idea of coordinating, uh, of uh, transmitting best practices to governments on how you know, to counteract in the field of com communication strategy? Here you have Stratcom, that is a very good instrument. I think they have great capabilities and they could maybe give a hand to governments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The gentleman with the glasses, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Krzysztof Bobinski from Warsaw in Poland. I um, just want to thank Franz Timmermans for what he has done, is doing, and unfortunately will have to continue to do to preserve the rule of law in, in Poland and, and Hungary. Uh, you really are in the front line uh, of the fight against populism. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, that was short and sweet. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's a, a lady I said here, and a gent there, and another one, over, and then you, sir. Yes, so we'll come here, we'll, right in the middle. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure you can, but use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lisa Post, and I'm an analyst in Estonia. Thank you for that as well. I mean, in its essence, populism is anti-elitism. And the, in this particular iteration, it's also anti-intellectualism. So conspiracy theories claim the idea of there's someone who's taken your rightful information or position. And identity politics is also a tool of doing all of that. Yes. So my question really addresses, asks you to address the cleavages that have driven us here. Because as President Freiberg outlined, the feelings of alienation or the feeling of being left behind that drives populism is a legitimate one in those who feel it. So pooling the collective wisdom on the stage, which there is a lot of, could you look further into the cleavages and the reasons driving that feeling and how to address that? Because otherwise we're just painting a broken house. Okay, thank you very much. We'll take one more question here. Thank you. Klaus Wittmann, Aspen Institute, uh, Germany and uh, Potsdam University. To dry out the populist movement that was so successful in the recent German elections, I have a few points and one question. The reasons must be analyzed. The worries of people must be taken more serious. The problem-solving capacity of governments and also of the European Union must be demonstrated much more uh, um, uh, convincingly. Okay. On the facts, their bluff must be called, and the very poor performance of their deputies, for instance, in the, in no, I think, 13 German states and uh, in future in the Bundestag, must be unmasked week after week. No positive contributions no answers, no solutions. And lastly, and this brings me to my question, a little bit of self-criticism of the traditional parties and their leaders would be in order. I am not unhappy that Mrs. Merkel will form the government again, but that she stands there after the election and says, I see no reason for policy change, leaves me breathless. And uh, that is my question. Why do politicians seem to be incapable 
of some self-criticism, which I think would gain them a lot of trust. Okay, thanks very much. Maybe we'll start, with, start from that perspective. Um, one of our uh, elected politicians from the top end. Uh, if I'd like to start with the ambassador's comment about the extreme right and the extreme left. I said they are brothers under the skin. They do not wear the same skin. Uh, what is, uh, what uh, they have in common is paranoia, basically. That is the deepest feeling that they appeal to. In other words, mania of grandeurs and, and, uh, and suspicion, mania of persecution. That's a very strong basis for all extreme positions. Uh, they ultimately have um, a thirst for power that goes beyond that generally acceptable in democracy. Uh, and when you scratch deep down, you will find that they have actually little respect for individual rights and individual opinions. However, the buttons that they push in the population in order to uh, gain access to their hearts and to their support, yes, the right and the left do push different buttons. Uh, but they have in common a great many fundamental aspects, uh, none of them very helpful. About politicians and self-correcting, I, I think that uh, uh, politics should be have a built-in servo mechanism, just like you have in, in, in a thermostat that controls the humidity and the temperature in, in your rooms. Uh, it should be taken for granted that any political party or any government or any politician uh, does not write their, say, their government declaration uh, and then forever and ever uh, blindly follow the same thing. Uh, then, like, uh, like a friend of mine who was recently uh, presenting the, the president's uh, kind of series of lectures um, uh, two days ago here in Riga, he had this idea that the solution to our problems would be to do away with elected parliaments, to draw uh, them by lottery, have a lottery and for each piece of legislation you'd have a different crowd uh, drawn at random like in a jury selection and they would decide and you send them away uh, and go on with the next one. Uh, I can imagine a situation where in the future we will have algorithms uh, that we will not just have you know, driverless cars, pilotless planes, uh, um, hospitals without doctors and I don't know anything else, uh, where we will, when we get a message, uh, we will have some sort of uh, automatic analysis, an algorithm that will give us the probability of how, how likely it is to be close to facts or truth, or if it's a matter of uh, a really specific question like vaccination, uh, to somehow do a ponderation of all the factors in the available research, and uh, the poor soul, um, the average citizen, cannot be expected to go through all the literature about it, even professionals can't manage, but the algorithm will, will nicely do it for them, and then it will, uh, assuming the algorithm is not been tampered with, uh, the algorithm will then uh, give them the right answer. <laughs> um, but uh, the self-correcting, server mechanism, I think is a crucial aspect of democracy. And also the, the wonderful British idea about Her Majesty's loyal opposition. In other words, that you, yes, you do have a ruling party and a ruling uh, body uh, that take power because they won the elections, uh, but you do not forget about the opposition. They are legitimate and other points of view have the right to be heard, but they must be loyal to Her Majesty. Well, in my understanding Her Majesty is democracy and, and uh, human rights and everything else that democracy stands for. Okay, thank you very much. As Sven, and, and this issue about being more self-critical, I mean, is that, that, that would help? Well, uh, I don't know. Well, um, uh, there are consultants who provide advice for people going to job interviews, and election is a kind of job interview. And those consultants usually do not uh, uh, tell people that, well, you should co be completely honest about your mistakes and uh, about bad things you've done in the past, and then you will be probably employed because of your honesty. Um, that, that, that simply doesn't happen. Nor, I mean, when you, when you think of commercials advertising uh, washing powder, I mean, uh, you, you, uh, haven't, you, you probably don't see many saying that, well, our washing powder um, does leave some stains but uh, you should buy us for our honesty. 
that simply doesn't happen. I mean, that's a sad fact of, of, of life. Uh, obviously, I mean, political, uh, politicians are, uh, well, do, uh, do make mistakes. And, uh, and uh, the, some of the politicians are very well aware of the mistakes and, and, and would like to have done some things differently in the past and definitely try to learn from the past mistakes. But, uh, but uh, I think in this uh, very ruthless uh, game, uh, the, the sort of admitting having made a mistake is, is, is interpreted as, uh, as a sign of weakness and indecisiveness, and, and it doesn't really produce your votes. If it did, I mean, someone would probably have cracked that and uh, have have, have used it to, 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 to win an election. Um, that's, that's, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's good that, that, that this is the way it is, but, but, but that's the way it is, I believe. But um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the other uh, questions, I think that the, the one, one way of, uh, of dealing with the populism is, is actually to focus very much on, on the, uh, what, what we call uh, societal resilience. And, and that includes the, the, the psychological resilience. I mean, basically uh, raising the, the, the level of, of awareness about the threats that are out there, also in connection with this sort of uh, uh, false information and fake news and, and, and um, uh, plurality of different truths in this post-truth world. No, truth, truth world. And so this psycholo uh, sort of psychological resilience is part of the, of the, of the uh, uh, resilience of the society. That's, that's the key word. Okay, and I, and I don't want to go right around the houses on, on the point raised here, but James, could I ask you about anti, the, that populism is anti-intellectualism? Um, well, you know, I think any extreme political movement can have elements of that in that and can be the death knell of democracy. Um, and the counterdote for that is transparency because transparency is not just a counterdote against anti-intellectualism or populism. It's also a, a, an antidote against elitism and corporatism and oligarchs, right? Because it, because it goes back to basic public choice theory. People can make a choice and in the more transparency, the more knowledge they have and the consequences uh, and the cause and effect of what's happening to them, then they can make their a more informed choice. So not to be critical of the EU, but this to me is a kind of part of the problem. If the notion is, is for the voter is, I can't distinguish between whether my state is at fault or whether the EU is at fault, that's a problem. And, and Macron's answer of, we're all Europeans. If I'm a voter, that's not super helpful to me. It's like, I'm pissed, who do I vote out? And you're telling me, well, we're all responsible. Well, if you're all responsible, nobody's responsible. So there has to be a certain level of transparency so people know who is making the decisions that's changing their life. So the next time they get to vote, they can decide if they want to vote them back in or not. So what do you say then if you've been screaming, lock her up for months, and then it turns out that some of your people have used a private server? I mean, that, that's I say I say 2018. Uh, uh, I say I 2018 and 2020. But you create, uh, what I mean is you create a... Um, a zero-sum game in democracy. And this 2018 is something and 2020, because you say, you say that locker up was bogus, it was bad and everything else. The voters have that all the information. If no. they don't like it, they'll vote in 2018 no. and 2020 and they'll vote them out. Sure, perhaps, but at the same time you create an antagonism in society that makes it more difficult to build bridges where we need to build bridges. How are you ever going to find solutions that can be carried by society if you just refuse to build bridges and you um, install a winner-takes-all democracy? That is my worry. And when I say, um, uh, perhaps just one sentence, why is it important what Macron says? It is one of these things where he takes responsibility. And he says, we in the past blamed Europe for everything, but we should take responsibility for this. He's not saying we're all to blame. He's saying we should take responsibility when Europe acts, it's on behalf of the member states, so we have part of that responsibility. So I think this is one of, you know, you could say, um, accept the blame if you do something wrong. I couldn't agree more. But it starts with taking responsibility. And this re responsibility for harnessing globalization can no longer be taken only by individual member states. The scale of those states is simply too small to actually be effective in harnessing globalization. So you need to take more collective responsibility in Europe. That means at the scale of, of the EU. Now, if you see what um, traditional parties have done differently, if I just you know, think about my own country and some other countries, 
What has happened all the time is that our values were strongly under attack uh, of uh, the populists. To the people who support the populists, they didn't see the values under attack, they saw the establishment under attack. Um, when we defended, thought we were defending our values, in the eyes of the people who support the populists, we were defending the establishment. So, two mistakes at the same time. And the good news in this is that the people who support the populists do not necessarily support their attack on our values, but they do support the attack on the status quo, which is not working for them. So in that is also the solution. The established parties should stop defending the establishment and the status quo and should inspire a project that will change the status quo in the direction of taking everyone in society, the largest possible majority in society, towards a better future. I think, you know, answering your question about where the answer lies, I think there's a bit of an answer there. I could talk for hours about this, but that's not the point here. I'm just trying to say that on both sides we got the electorate wrong, and we should be looking less at the populist politicians and more at the electorate they mobilize and why they're able to mobilize that electorate. Okay, thank you very much for that passionate uh, call. The gentleman, that we're down to the last five minutes, so please, if you can just give us the question, and so then you, and uh, we're going to have to push on. Um, yes, uh, Konstantin Agatz, I'm, uh, I'm a presenter for TV Dost in Moscow and the columnist for Deutsche Welle. Uh, my question is actually to the European participants. Uh, Mr. Timmermans, you said um, there needs kind of big project taking everyone along, and probably you should send a European to Mars, that would be a good idea. Uh, but uh, my question is actually about the future of the European uh, welfare system and uh, socially oriented economy. It seems that uh, populism, which is about globalization and about the other, you know, immigration and stuff like that. And you seem to be in a, in a, in a vicious circle because uh, to accept and integrate uh, immigration, mass, mass immigration, you have probably to do two things, either enhance national identities, which is not comme il faut after the Second World War and Nazis and stuff like that, or you have to free up the market, which will integrate people. It seems that the first one is not possible for political reasons, and the second one is also not possible for political reasons. <laughs> so it seems like it feeds populism uh, because there is no solution, or am I wrong? Okay, thank you. And then uh, the last question down here. Uh, thank you, Senzak of ICDS uh, Tallinn in previous life in cyber defense. Uh, President Freiburger talked about future of artificial intelligence driving, driving uh, cars and so forth, um, doctorless um, hospitals. So uh, my question really, and this is about populism, is how do you deal with populism? How do you prepare for that if in a couple of maybe three decades half of our workforce will be out because they have been automatized? A serious study say that basically 47% of all jobs are at risk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, who, who would like to address the issues, uh, President? Um, my husband, Nimans, who's a computer scientist, uh, way back in the 60s, uh, said that uh, when artificial intelligence was, was in its infancy, was saying that the day will come when having a job and the privilege of working will be reserved only for the few. And I think it's, it's already uh, going in that direction. Uh, at the same time, you see, we have two different uh, forces. Uh, one is the demographic decline of Europe. Uh, the declining birth rate, uh, the declining percentage of Europeans as, a, as against the world population. Uh, and on the other hand, the fact that, yes, we already have, for instance, youth unemployment at a totally unacceptable level uh, in a number of European Union countries. But my colleague, Philippe uh, Gonzalez, on our uh, reflection group uh, on the future of Europe, uh, used to say that uh, he, having been four times elected prime minister uh, of Spain, uh, and the first democratically elected after Franco, uh, said, well, what we did is, is we wanted to protect the workers. So we set up a system uh, where actually what we are protecting are the jobs. 
the jobs are protected, uh, but the freedom of movement, the flex security, if you like, of, of populations has been severely hampered. Uh, companies faced with the prospect of uh, taking on an employee and being stuck with them uh, for the rest of the, that person's natural life till, till retirement, regardless of what kind of performance they have, because the law requires it, will actually be reluctant uh, to o offer new jobs, uh, will uh, be farming out various uh, aspects of their operations, uh, will be going for uh, temporary jobs and so on and so on. In other words, you can have the best intentions in the world uh, and find after the fact uh, that there are side effects, just like with drugs, uh, there are side effects that are undesirable. And what do you do? You have to correct your course. Uh, and that is what's happening all the time. And here again, I say, it is, um, uh, it's not helpful to say, well, it was a mistake. Uh, you might say, we tried our best, we thought it was a great solution, it was very fair, we're looking after the workers, uh, and we did. And then it turns out that it has side effects we did not anticipate. Well, then you have to correct them. It's no point beating your chest and saying we were horribly wrong or pointing your finger and saying these people were very nasty and short-sighted. But I think one should roll up one's sleeves and just get down to it and see what we can do about it. Okay, um, so I did say please finish, but I actually I've just had a word in my ear uh, that we really do have to close now, uh, otherwise I'm going to get in trouble. So that's a good reason to stop now. Um, I'd just like to say, first of all, thank you very much for the questions, for, for all the tweets as well. Apologies for those who tweeted in languages other than English, French and German, but I didn't trust myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and above all, could I ask you to put your hands together for uh, an exceptional panel. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to ask my panelists to join me just off the platform here as I'd like to hand over now to uh, Chairman of the Riga Conference, Thomas Baumann. Thomas. I also want to thank distinguished panel and David for excellent moderation and all audience for asking provocative questions and engaging. Um, a few words before I give floor to Honorable Minister Edgar Srinjevic, who stood behind the co-organized, co-hosted RIG conference for a long time. Uh, this year we have grown in numbers and, 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 and in size and it's getting more and more difficult to manage. We have a long list of uh, supporters who were uh, gracious enough to share financial and other kind of support. I want to thank all of them. We have about 70 volunteers, uh, among them um, seven from other countries, from United States, Bulgaria, Slovak Republic, Poland, and others. We have a team who put all this together, and this team has been working hard. Um, I would like to ask, my team to come up on the on the stage, so uh, we can thank them. Um, Katrina, green room, raise the hand. Thank you. Uh, Sabine, please raise the hand. She is a secretary general. <laughs> Evita, accommodations. Elina, media coordinator. Anna, young leaders forum, and uh, Peter is also young leaders forum. As you see. The future belongs to the young generation. With this said, I, I uh, want to thank you, and uh, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours for your final wrap-up words. Well, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Thank you for your 12th conference. We we're sitting together and we are counting how many times we have been sitting in Riga conference and both of us counted. And it's my sixth wrap-up of the conference, which uh, I would say is a kind of annual checkup of the global and regional health of our security 
and economy. Uh, last year, when we were discussing regional and global security issues, uh, we had probably a bit gloomier mood than today. We were fresh after Brexit vote. We were still uncertain about election results in the United States. We were all bit, we were a little bit worried about the Dutch, the French, and the German elections. Now it's all in history. And I think that to some extent, when we discuss issues today, when we discussed issues yesterday, we still understand that US are fully engaged. We still see that NATO is not obsolete, and we still pay our dues to NATO and to our security, even more. Actually, European Union is going to do much more about defense and security than one could imagine even five or ten years ago. I think also that uh, elections in European Union, also discussions here have shown that actually there is a window of opportunity for all of us, for the European Union. We all see that we want to have a kind of a new reformed European Union that is much closer to its people than probably it used to be a year or two ago. And for my country, for Latvia, there is no big question should we be a core, the second or the third speed European Union country. We want to be at the core. We want to be at the highest possible level of integration. We want to, an open debate on where we could do more, where we could do better. And that's one thing that I particularly cherish in this discussion today about populism. In discussions previously we had about the Nordic Baltic regional dimension. In discussions we had also yesterday about economic and security issues. Also, I would like to say that um, for uh, us here in Latvia, uh, this year is 99th anniversary of proclamation of the Republic of Latvia. Next year we are going to celebrate 100th anniversary along with our Lithuanian, Estonian friends, many nations in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, our 100 years have been particularly challenging. Latvia was built on the ashes of the Russian Empire after very devastating World War I. We have had our 20 years of independence then followed by two occupations, Nazi and Soviet occupation. Also for us it has been quite a time to rebuild our nation, to become part of European family one more time again. And before this um, conference, I somehow looked back in YouTube. Now you can always find history on YouTube, not so much anymore in history books. And I still remember the speech given at NATO Prague summit by then President of the Republic of Latvia, Vaira Vita Freiberg, who said that uh, we will always cherish those liberties we have lost and we have regained. That speech was probably one of the best received speeches at that summit and I think that those principles stand also very strong together. That's why I think that even with all the uh, skepticism we have, all the pessimism and with the Western culture of always criticizing and questioning everything to, down to the fundamentals, we still do need to remember that we always have windows of opportunity. We always can work for better societies, but we always should remember that both the Atlantic family as well as European Union is built, first of all, as union of values, union of rule of law, union of human rights. So I very much hope to see you all next year. And now, finally, I also want to say a huge thanks to all the participants, to all the sponsors, but mainly to those people who were volunteers, who were working tirelessly to make this conference flawless again. Thank you very much. See you next year.